Um, have you guys ever started a project uh, or, no, had a project but, but couldn't start, right? Like, I, I joke about how not handy I am around the house, right? I mean, I've, <laughs> you know, we've literally talked about it here on a Sunday. When, when I moved into my house uh, a couple years ago here in Castle Rock, one thing I noticed was that my basement was cold. Now, I know your basement's cold, too, you know, if you have a basement, but mine felt like extra cold, you know, like, like the kind where you can't stand there without having a coat on, but there's vents, like, and there's heat that's on, and I'm just like, there's something, there's something wrong, you know, and so I had to figure out, uh, I got, got to do something. Well, I haven't done anything, you know, spoiler alert, because uh, there's so many places that, the, that it could be the start, like it could be uh, the fact that uh, the windows aren't that good, and they're, they're letting a bunch of air in. It could be the little vents that we have on the side of our house for the, the furnace exhaust to go in and out. Uh, there's a crawl space underneath, so perhaps that needs to be insulated better. Um, or it's just physics, like warm air rises, you know, cold air falls. Uh, and so I don't really know where to start, and so I kind of just haven't. <laughs> I just wear coats and blankets when I'm downstairs in the basement. Um, do, do you, can you relate to that at all? Like whenever there's a project that's so big, and you're like, I need to do something, but I have no clue where to start. So you just kind of like someday, right? And you just kind of keep kicking it off and just kind of sit back. That's me with like big house projects. Uh, but that's also me with something like evangelism, where like last week we talked about if you're close to Jesus, you'll be close to people that need Jesus, period. So there's going to be these opportunities for evangelism. Ah, evangelism. Well, how in the world am I supposed to change what someone believes about something so deep as eternal realities, you know, and the existence of God? You know, and so we, we have all these doubts that, ah, maybe, you know, like me with my basement, I'm hoping that there's going to be some, like, easy, quick fix. Like, oh, it turns out you just had to flip the, you let the vent be open, you know, and they, oh, great, good. You know, and, and so we don't end up doing anything with evangelism, even though we know we're supposed to do something. Uh, this this week for the sermon, we're going to look at uh, what is our starting line? What, what's our jumping off point, right? Big, big ah, I don't know how to do evangelism. Well, where do we start? What's the starting point for evangelism? That's what I want to encourage you. We're going to be looking throughout the Bible to find out uh, what is the biblical evangelism model, the model that the Bible says, here's how you share your faith. Uh, now, if we, we, could, we could read through the whole Bible. Uh, that'd probably take us more than one Sunday. Um, So here's what we would find. We'd find that there's two primary models of evangelism, ways that uh, people hear about God's love. Uh, They're introduced to God's love in two main ways. There's the pre-Jesus way in the Old Testament, and then there's the post-Jesus way, after Jesus shows up. Uh, There's two very different. In the the pre-Jesus way, uh, it's very much wait for people to come, and by your life you you, you attract them, and then you share why you're living a certain way. The post-Jesus model in the New Testament, people are more active there, sent out to tell one of them uh, how it uh, kind of breaks down or what that strategy is. And then we can look and see, well, what about us? Where do we start? How do we find ourselves in this biblical model? Uh, The Old Testament. Quick summary. It's it's the story of God's people, Israel. It's about the creation of God's people. It's about how they lived with him. uh, And then ultimately their hope for a savior to come and kind of establish all the broken parts about them to create God's kingdom on earth. Uh, the New Testament talks about uh, Jesus, the, the Savior of the world, how he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And then it's a story about the church, uh, Jesus' followers that then share this information with everyone to invite them in. Well, in the Old Testament, we'll start there first. Um, it's really hard to summarize the Bible, you know, so strap in. We're going to try, try to get through all of this. Um, but in the Old Testament, uh, when God is forming his people, Israel, he uh, leads them out of slavery in Egypt. Uh, he raises up Moses as their leader. He speaks to Moses a ton of commands, a ton of very specific ways that he wants the Israelites, his people, to live. And so Moses in Deuteronomy, which is what we're going to read first here, he, uh, he's summarizing uh, why do we have to live all these different things. Like, is it just for ourselves that we would live just such a narrow lifestyle and be distinct from others? And Moses says there's an additional reason for why we're living in such a way with these commands that God gave us. I'm checking. Yes. All right. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you're entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully. For this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations 
who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? In, in an ideal world, uh, well, you probably know that the Bible, the Old Testament, has a bunch of laws for Israel. Those laws aren't just for Israel to thrive and prosper and to be blessed and to live with God. That's very much in there. That's what Moses says. But it's also said that the nations would see it and be amazed, wonder, like, whoa, how can you have such a close relationship to God? How are you so wise and so righteous? Like, you're, you're living life correctly. This is the model of evangelism for the Old Testament. This is the biblical model is that we would live righteous lives before God, and we'd receive his blessings. We would have this great relationship with God, and other people, other nations that don't have this would say, wow, what is that? How can I know God through you? Uh, and this worked. This, this, it, this is described as working in the Old Testament. The, um, the Old Testament has kind of a narrative arc where Israel starts kind of low and then kind of gets a little bit better, and then they kind of drift back away from God. But at the very peak where Israel's at, at its closest relationship with God, they're very righteous, they're living with him, uh, we, he, we see an example. This is 1 Kings 10, which I say is probably the chapter at the very peak of, of Israel's existence in terms of how well they are living according to God's plan. I'm not going to read the whole thing because otherwise we're just going to read too much Bible today. I know that sounds wrong, but mark this. 1 Kings 10 to read it on your own. Got to give you guys some homework. All right, this is about the Queen of Sheba, which is a foreign uh, nation. She, she does not know Israel, but she has heard about Israel, in particular King Solomon. When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Uh, if you read along or when you read along, you'll find out uh, that she's amazed at Solomon's wisdom, amazed at all of the blessings that God has provided Solomon because he has been faithful and living righteously. And then ultimately, here is queen of she the queen of Sheba's response, who probably worships other gods. But this is verse 9. She says, Praise be to the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. This is the biblical evangelism model working. When, when, when God's people, Israel, is faithful to God, when they have this deep relationship to him, word spreads and four nations say, Wow, that is amazing. Let me come learn more about it. And they leave praising God. They they know who God is. They're introduced to God because of how God's people are living. Uh, there's other examples of this as well. So uh, you follow the decline of Israel. They grow further and further from God. Uh, God leaves them as they run far away, and they're, Israel's ultimately conquered by Babylon, and most of the people are exiled to a foreign land uh, where no one worships God. There seems to be uh, maybe more of a worship of secular power, uh, but there's other foreign gods that prop that up. Uh, but we still see this evangelistic model at work. Uh, the book of Daniel is an incredibly inspirational book because the first six chapters of Daniel are six short vignettes where there's these young men who grow old through the, the six chapters, but it's Daniel and his three friends who are faithful God followers and fearers. They've been stripped away from their homeland, from their families, and they're trying to find out uh, a new way of living in this foreign land. And each one of these six vignettes, there's this conflict between the powers in these foreign countries, usually represented by kings, and then there's these guys <laughs> that are faithful. And so it's, who, who are they going to follow? Are they going to follow uh, their God and be righteous according to the laws that don't even exist anymore because Israel doesn't exist? Or will they compromise and just follow the customs and the ways of the new world that they have? Uh, and if you've read any of these stories with Daniel, uh, this is uh, the Daniel in the lion's den. This is the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fire for, being, uh, for refusing to bow down to the, uh, to the idols that, that were made. Uh, but they choose faithfulness every single time. And, and the Bible makes it clear, at least um, in, the, in the book of Daniel, that it has an impact on those who don't know God. Like Here's, here's an example of one of the kings. This is Nebuchadnezzar at the end of Daniel chapter 3. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. So the witness, the faithfulness of God's people ends up impacting this king where he says, praise be to this God. There's another king at the end of chapter 6. This is King Darius after, um, after Babylon. Turns out they aren't going to rule the world till the end of time. They get uh, taken over by yet another country. But he says, then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth. May you prosper greatly. This is to, to Daniel. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. What we see here in this uh, Old Testament biblical model of evangelism is that through the righteousness of God's people, People understand. Other people, people that don't know God, get to know who he is. We see King Darius saying, I'm going to write this to everyone. Every one of my uh, people within my sphere of influence have to fear and worship this God. And how, how did that happen? Well, because Daniel was faithful even in the face of death. That's, that's the Old Testament biblical model of evangelism. You live a righteous life. You know God deeply and well, and you just live that in all areas. And people will come and they will see and they will know about who God is through your witness. In the New Testament, things change. Once Jesus shows up, he is the fulfillment of all these hopes and prophecies that we saw in the Old Testament. And, and then Jesus sends out his disciples and says, go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, no longer is it simply just live a certain lifestyle and people will see and then you'll, you'll share with them. It's, you know, you, you go out there and tell them, about who Jesus is, uh, that Jesus is the Christ. And that's how they will know uh, who God is and be introduced to his love. Uh, this is embodied, I think, best in Paul's missions, uh, missionary journeys. He takes three journeys. Uh, they're, they're, they're talked about in Acts. Uh, but then we've got a lot of his letters later on to the various churches that he has planted uh, through just sharing the gospel. I want to read uh, one of those letters uh, to the Thessalonians, because not only is it the content of his message, he talks about the, the process, the strategy, the evangelistic method that Paul uses. Uh, I think we've, we're going to have it up on the screen here because it's a little bit longer. We're going to go 1 Thessalonians 2, the second half of verse 7, all the way down to verse 12. He says, Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked day, oh, night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So there he is. He's saying, I'm encouraging you to live lives worthy of God, uh, just like we'd expect him to. He's telling them about who Jesus is and to worship Jesus as the Christ, as God. Uh, but did you notice how he did it? Right? Like he says, just as a nursing mother cares for her children. Right? Like, I mean, what, what sort of metaphor can you use that would express more love? <laughs> right? So we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. And he says, uh, we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Uh, Paul expresses a deep amount of love and care for these strangers. Like He had never been to Thessalonica before, but, but he decides my message is going to be accompanied with a tremendous amount of care and love for you. And, and then how did... Uh, how did they know that they could trust him? Well, it says, uh, you are witnesses, and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. Uh, Paul in the previous section says, we, we weren't doing this for money. He says, we work night and day in order that you wouldn't have to pay us. And he says, uh, we weren't going for fame. We weren't trying to get uh, man's approval here. No, I actually just genuinely care about you, and you can look at my life. I'm living a righteous life, holy life, a blameless life. I actually believe this. 
And so the people of Thessalonica couldn't, uh, they didn't just hear the gospel message, but they could also see the gospel message through Paul's life. He was the embodiment of the message that he made. Uh, it reminds me of uh, one of the community group leaders who mentioned, we were talking about this, uh, this series, and he shared uh, this quote uh, that's usually attributed to Francis of Assisi, except we, we aren't for sure if he actually wrote this. There's, there's no written documents of it, but uh, it gets attributed to him. Uh, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. Uh, the concept behind this quote is the same thing that Paul is saying, is that our lifestyle should indicate what we believe. Because what we believe is a relationship with God, is a transformed life. And so if we have that and we share that everywhere that we go so that anyone who comes into contact with us will understand at least a little bit of the gospel. And then to clarify, we use words to tell them what it is. When we think about evangelism from a biblical model, it's not saying a certain thing. That you won't find a script uh, that's consistent throughout or here's how you're supposed to talk about God's love. What you see consistently throughout is that there's a certain lifestyle that we're supposed to be living and that in and of itself is the gospel message. And so if we're saying what, what's our starting line here uh, for evangelism, big project, our starting line for evangelism is our life. Period. It's how we live. Uh, the message that we share of God's love should be embodied with our love for other people. Uh, the, the message that we share about God being sovereign and loving us should be reflected in our wanting to live righteously before him and enjoy his blessings. So that then when we're living in our life, it becomes much easier to share what we have. Uh, what does this look like in practicality? Uh, a lot of the people in the Bible, uh, when you look at how do, how do people hear about God from other people, uh, we, we, have to, we have to admit uh, God shows up. Uh, the only reason we know anything about God's love is because God reveals himself to us. Bottom line, we can't know God unless he's revealing himself to us. But oftentimes he uses people to share who he is, to reveal. There's, there's many stories of people learning about God's love, being introduced to God through other people. And, and the vast majority of them, the relationship that they have where they learn is through their parents. In, in just a few chapters after Moses' Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 6, uh, there's a famous uh, passage called the Shema, where it's, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, uh, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Right after that verse, it talks about impress them upon your, uh, upon your children. Uh, put, teach them to your families as you're walking, as you're going. Um, let this be a part of your life. Let it be deep down in your life, and a big reason of that is your kids. We see Abraham, who is selected by God to be uh, the, the father of Israel. That's the, the birth of Israel kind of starts uh, in Genesis chapter 12, where we see this specific plan where God calls Abram at the time, but he changes his name to Abraham. Uh, and Abraham doesn't know who God is, but God reveals himself to him. But then we see Isaac and Jacob, which is Abraham's son and his grandson. They also make altars to God. Well, how do they know how to interact with God? How do they know what this relationship with God is supposed to be? Well, they literally saw their father, and they modeled themselves after it. So if you are a parent, one of your responsibilities is to train up your children uh, in the way that they should go. And so if you're already living a life that is trusting in God, that's leaning on God, that has a relationship with God, that knows his love, that praises and worships his love, spends time with him, then it's natural. Just include your kids in that. You, you know, just pray with them about the things that are on your heart. When they share something to you, uh, pray with them. Demonstrate what it looks like uh, to, to come to God. Uh, take them with you to church. Uh, talk to them about uh, what's going on in their life or what they're learning about God or what questions they have. Include them in your life. Just start with your life. Uh, now, if that's not where you're at, uh, if you tend to forget God, if you uh, don't run to him first when things happen, if you don't set aside time to, to, to worship him or really give him a big spot in your life, uh, it's going to be a whole lot harder uh, to teach them how to do this or to help introduce God to them. You know, it's, it, it's a whole lot harder to lead someone down a path uh, where you've never been. And so as parents, our responsibility is to show our kids where the path is that they should go. So for us, our starting line is our life. Let's make sure that we are living this, and then it's a whole lot easier to be the guide for others. Also, caring for other people. 
uh, like what Paul said about this deep care that he had for them, like a nursing mother, like a father, sharing lives, not just the gospel or not just words. Uh, we should uh, care about the people around us uh, when we're evangelizing. Now think about it like this. Our message of God's love is that God loves us so much that he wants to be with us. You know, again, I, I always go back. The fact that we celebrate Christmas, I mean, that's rare. No other, no other religion gets to celebrate the fact that their God came down to be with us. That's the embodiment of God's love that we're trying to introduce people to. And so our life is a part of that message. When we love and we reach out, we pursue people, and we care to connect with them, we're expressing God's love through ourselves. So one way to check is if there's someone on your heart, on your mind, uh, perhaps it's a neighbor or a friend or a coworker uh, that you're not already connected with, um, how, how much do you care about them? Uh, do you want to have a relationship with them even if they choose to reject? Even if they hear the gospel from you and they choose to reject it, do you still want to be their friend? You have to say yes, otherwise you're not ready to share the gospel with them. Because God's love is unending, ever pursuing us, even when we choose to go our own way. So let's make sure that our care for others is genuine and not simply uh, another piece of, of bait that we can put on our lure and toss out there in the ocean. We want to have genuine relationships because that's the kind of love God has with us. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, a righteous life. You know, we see in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's people are supposed to follow him not just for our own benefit, and not just to have a relationship with God. That yields so many benefits, so much blessing in our life, so much peace, so much wholeness that we have, but also in order that other people might be able to see, you've, you've figured it out. The riddle of life, you have the answer to. So any area of our life that, that we are refusing to submit to God, that we're keeping kind of to ourselves, or we don't really want to submit, to follow him, or bring in line, not only is that preventing us from experiencing God in a more deeply way, that's putting a barrier between other people knowing who our God is. Because uh, that is the evangelism model that our God has created <laughs> based on how much we reflect who he is in our own lives. So let's seek to live holy and pure lives. Uh, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. Our deeds are meant to be a way that others can see a bright light and say, I want that, and praise God for it. We see the examples in the Bible. Let's make sure our lives are shining brightly so that we can also have examples. I've got some questions. Again, just like last week, uh, I'd love for us to take time and apply it. So I don't think I said anything in this sermon that's controversial. I think we're all probably going to agree, yes, I need my life to line up with what God looks like. Uh, but the next step for us is what, what does this look like for me personally, specifically? How am I going to do this in my life? And so for each of these, uh, we're going to take time in groups uh, just to think and share. Uh, for me in my specific life, here's the step that I would take. Here's my starting line. Uh, the first one is how can we let our family see our faith? Challenge yourself. Uh, where are those elements that we're incorporating our family so that they can see the relationship that we have with God? Secondly, what are natural ways we can show we care about others? Uh, be specific. Uh, what's going to feel gimmicky? What's going to feel like, like it's not genuine from your perspective? How can you genuinely share, I, I care about you, to, to a stranger, to, to like a coworker or a neighbor or someone that maybe you don't have a strong relationship with? And then lastly, how have you seen other Christians live faithful lives that stand out? Uh, what is it about Christians that you have seen that looks, wow, that is different or that's significant or that is a praise or a worship of God just in how they are choosing to live their life faithfully. Uh, I'm not going to give you full time to answer all three of these questions. Pick the one that you find most compelling. Uh, let's break into groups and then let's just talk about uh, that one as a way to help encourage one another to take the next step.
going to cut you off right there. You guys are doing great. Keep the conversations going. This is the kind of conversation we should be having with each other to encourage us to apply this biblical model, to live righteous lives, to care, truly love the people around us, uh, to lead our families down the right path. Uh, I want to just conclude with a, a short story that I had. Uh, I, I go to the library every now and then. So, so my family's a reading family. We were, we were called that by one of my, my kids' friends. Um, I'm the one that's not a reader, uh, but I, I'm the one that's sent to the library to pick up all their books on hold. And so the habit that I've picked up that I can do, it's like kind of that, that fruit that's my level that I can pick, is I'll, I'll look in front of the new books, the rack, and I'll just pick one that looks good, and I'll read about the first third of it, and then I'll get bored, and then I'll take it back. Uh, but at least I'm checking out books, and the library knows that I fit in my family, who's a reading family. Uh, I, I checked out this book recently, all that to say. What I'm really trying to say is that I, I picked out this book recently, and it's called How to Talk to a Science Denier. And I thought, this is going to be good. And it's all about this guy who is, is concerned about people that don't believe in science, and he's trying to find a way to convince them uh, to, to accept scientific evidence. He actually goes to a flat earther conference, and he goes around trying to convince them they're wrong. And so he writes a book about his experience, about what works, what doesn't work. And I thought, well, isn't this fascinating? Because here we are doing an evangelism series about how do we change people's mind about really significant things. What is his conclusion going to be about how to change people's mind about really significant things in their life? This is what he said. I, th I, think, it's, I think it's hilarious. I can't read that. I've got to turn around. He says, uh, this is about his experience of presenting evidence at this conference, and people really didn't change their mind. He goes, but is any of this really going to change their identity? Maybe if we do it in the right way, face-to-face, -face, over time, with more than one conversation, where we actually listen, which might form into a relationship where our evidence is welcome. That sounds like a lot of hard work, but I think that especially if we are trying to convert the beliefs of a committed science denier, we must commit to the work of trying to change their identity, probably in person, by trying to build trust through a personal relationship. Isn't that fascinating? He says the way to change someone's beliefs about something they really believe is over time, through a relationship, by actually caring and listening about the person. Of course, to him, that's all the, the, that's all the lure and the bait, right? Because then maybe they'll, they'll get the evidence. This is the way that the biblical model of evangelism is for us. We're supposed to actually care and genuinely love them. But our message isn't just to get people to say, okay, I agree with that. I, I believe your evidence. No, the, the relationship that we're creating is the actual message. That is God's love coming to them. That is the nature of it. It suits, it suits us and our message so much more than it suits uh, whatever, uh, whether it's flat earthers or whatever other scientific uh, thing that he wants to convince other people to have. This is the way that we change people's identity. This is the way that we can introduce people to God's love. The starting line is with our life and how we're sharing it with others. So would you pray with me this morning that God would apply all of this to our lives and our church so that all of Castle Rock can know God's love. Dear God, you are good. You are loving. You are our Father. You care deeply about us. You've demonstrated that through sending your Son who died to make a way that we can know you. You don't stop pursuing us when we turn, when we reject you, and we praise you for that. Lord, help us. <laughs> Mold us to be like you. Mold us to have that level of care and compassion for others around us. Uh, teach us to be right in line with who you are, to live holy and blameless and righteous lives, like Paul said. Encourage us and give us strength to take that first step toward evangelism of just letting our life be pointed directly toward you. And then, Lord, when the people come, when they want to know who we are, when we're going out to share who you are, I pray that our lives would be a great witness, a great example, even, even greater than our words, Lord. And I pray that you'd use Beyond Church, the people of Beyond Church, to let other people know who you are, through who we are on the inside, through what our life is composed of, just full of you. We love you, Lord, and we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.